Hello, everybody. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for being here today. Criterion Edge runs multiple informative webinars throughout the year. Today, we'll be discussing plain language communication in healthcare, understanding the requirements and challenges of plain language content creation for multiple audiences. We are proud to announce that Criterion Edge has been awarded Company of the Year among top regulatory services companies. So how can we help you? You can book a free 30-minute consultation with our specialists to align on your plain language writing goals for this year. You can email us for your free consultation at consult at criterionedge.com. Our presenter today is Lori Mitchell, founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety and pharmacovigilance management and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory and medical writing solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. And now I would like to welcome Lori to give an overview of our session today. Hi, Lori. Hi, Olivia. Thanks, every, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. I, I think Olivia said we've got, we've got maybe a, a bit of a fun presentation today. There are moments in it that might be a little lighthearted because this is, you know, this is kind of difficult content to get through. It's, um, there's a lot to discuss. And I just want to give everyone an early heads up that this is just the first of a, I think, what's going to be a three part series on uh, plain language writing. Uh, this is the general overview. And so look for other email announcements from us shortly about, I think part two is going to be <clears throat> writing for um, the lay audience specifically, and then doing lay summaries for HCPs and regulatory requirements. So uh, that's, uh, that's what's on my mind. And I, I hope that you find this uh, this experience today useful and look forward, I look forward to your questions at the end. So our session today is about uh, lay language, essentially. Healthcare companies, you know, are, are need to communicate important information about their drugs and devices to a dive to diverse audiences, patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, the general public. And the use of plain language for communication can help ensure key health information and clinical research findings are understandable and accessible to all. So we're gonna talk a lot about that and a lot about the requirements of what constitutes plain language uh, in this presentation today. So that would be from producing clinical trial lay summaries for the general public to the more action-focused and informational content aimed at HCPs or even patients or caregivers, and the need to produce a multitude of plain language written deliverables, which has strained many already stretched internal teams. So I've got a couple of quotes as we go along. This is one, content is the user experience. Make your words count. Next slide. What I hope that we're gonna come away with today in the learning objectives is we're gonna cover some key aspects that define plain language writing and plain language content writing for multiple audiences. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, and many of you submitted questions when you registered and there were a lot of questions about how do we assess readability and suitability. We're gonna talk about that as well and the regulatory and legal requirements of plain language content. We've got a great slide at the end that's nothing but references, so stay tuned for that. And we're gonna go through a case study of a plain language summary case study. So a little bit about the, pro the project planning for the publication of a plain language summary, just to kind of pull all the pieces together. Next one. Here's a couple of quotes. So I, I just want you to kind of read them and take them in. 
Malcolm Gladwell, I just heard him say this the other day. Your first goal is to be clear and simple, to write at an eighth grade level, but with ideas that are super sophisticated. Does that sound familiar? All good nonfiction writing is about going out and finding someone else, our patients, our caregivers, the HCPs, the audience, and inhabiting their world and then representing it. And in Leonardo da Vinci, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So we're going to talk a lot about, so keep that in mind. Um, more words are not better. Next slide. So what is plain language writing? And another thing I'd like to say to this audience is there is, I understand that you've probably already gone on the internet and you've looked around, you've looked at your, your applicable regulations, you've Googled plain language writing, uh, so have I. You know, we, we do it for a living, but there is so much information out there. And there's, so, so I get that this today might be a really useful way to just kind of simplify it and put the pillars out there because we can't go into every detail in, in a, you know, a one hour long webinar. So let's just talk high level in some ways. This is a high level slide. Writing that is clear, concise, well organized, and follows other best practices appropriate, appropriate to the subject or field and intended audience. So that is codified into law in the United States in the Plain, Act, the Plain Writing Act of 2010. So this is not, these are not suggestions. Uh, these are, these are laws. And so the um, medical device and the pharma industries and other industries have taken this on because they're now required to legal. This is huge and legal, um, required to um, give instructions or provide information in ways that people can understand. And I was actually startled to see that plain language is communication your audience can understand the first time they read it or hear it. Uh, that feels like a high bar. The material must be in plain language. And if after reading the content, your intended audience should be able to find what they need, understand what they find the first time, and use what they find to meet their needs. So there's a lot packed into those sentences. Um, next slide, Olivia. Some key principles. These seem self-apparent, but let's just kind of walk through them a little bit. Write for your audience. All right. First of all, you need to know who your audience is and you need to define them. But when you've done that, then you need to write to those people and those people only. The information needs to be organized. It can't be, it's usually not suitable to just write lots and lots of words in paragraphs. And we'll talk more about what that means to organize the information. Choose your words carefully. I can't emphasize that enough. That is back to that simplicity. And later on, we're gonna talk about readability and suitability and it, it, is, it is based in all of these concepts right here. Choosing your words carefully, how you organize them, being concise, keeping it conversational, and then designing content presentation for reading unless it's not in a reading format. And following web standards and publication guidelines when those are applicable. I'm thinking social media here um, and other types of content and certainly publication guidelines. This is all in the references below in plainlanguage.gov. Next one. Again, these are some pillars. Plain language writing should be understandable to your audience. It must be neutral. So I want us to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion when we think about that. And so that neutrality needs to go across your, your diverse audience, even if it's an audience of patients. And we'll talk more about um, how, how the diversity in your audience, how best to handle that or address it. 
So neutrality is not just in your audience, like from BEI type of respect, but also from the content. The content should be factual, balanced, no bias, transparent, not promotional, which I know are sometimes our marketing colleagues are sensitive to. And there's the DEI, inclusive of all genders, nationalities, and ethnicities audience specific, determine what the appropriate reading and comprehension level is of your audience or work to a standard, whatever that standard is, determine the standard and write to that. Make sure that it's your content is relevant to that audience. In other words, you would talk differently to a parent of a child with leukemia then you would write content for the child. So make sure it's relevant. And, and the, of course, the comprehension. We're gonna talk a little bit about peer reviewed content and layout. This is quite, um, quite a topic. Uh, many of the resources that I've looked at talk about patient advocacy groups. Get someone to review your content that's actually a patient. Uh, tap into patient advocacy groups uh, to see if they will review. Because again, we can write and we think we're doing it correctly, but we don't live in their skin and we don't live with that disease or whatever the situation is. We likely don't live with that. So the, the peer reviewing of actual patients and or caregivers is is really gets a lot of buzz out on there out there on the internet. It's a really good best practice. And also the last point there, accessibility and discoverability. And we'll talk more about that, but none of this matters if the patients or the audience can't find it. This none of this content matters if they can't find it or access it. Next slide. Oh, this is a fun slide. I thought it would be fun to do a before and after. And I found some Olivia's standing by with an animate button. Um, this is a before of how something is actually written. So I'm just gonna give you a few seconds to read that, it's pretty dense. Calisthenics, how many people actually use the word calisthenics in their everyday language anymore? Okay, let's show us what it looks like after plain language writing it has been converted to plain language writing. Hello, that's, all, that's the message. The, the left side is kind of blah, 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 blah. And the right side is the message. Next one, which is I get a particular kick out of. So take, take this one in. That's one sentence, by the way. Okay. Now the after. <laughs> I, I hope some of you are chuckling. I, every time I read this, I get a kick out of it. Just do this is what the, what the plain language thing says. Just, just do this. All right, next. We, as I mentioned earlier, we got a lot of registration questions with regards to readability. Um, I wish I had the mag magic answer for you. I do not. Um, there are many, there is, there's many opinions. I'll talk about that. Is it eighth grade? Is it 12 years old? What's the right answer? Uh, one thing that I think you might find startling is that the average, the average grade level reading in the United States is um, eighth grade. That's the average. So there is, so what What do you, what, what do you choose? And there is no, and I also, I, I, I didn't know this, but it's, it's always startling to me. There is no consensus and there is no regulation that says what, what you as the manufacturers uh, need to write your plain language in. There's no consensus. There's no requirement. You have to choose. So that's what I say at the 
um, bottom. It seems it is up to the company or manufacturer to decide. So what does that mean? That means that uh, know your audience, which we're gonna get to in a minute. Who are you talking to? Um, is, it, is it very gender specific? Is the audience very gender specific? Is it very uh, ethnicity or race specific? Is it uh, age specific, pediatrics, for example? Or, or, or usually elderly. So these are this is the know your audience. Um, and then and when I looked around to see if I could find anything, there were lots of opinions, but um, no clear answer. Next slide. Readability, best practices, respect your audience, number one. So here's some suggestions. A lot, sorry, there's a lot of information on this slide. And I said it earlier, who are you talking to? So know your target audience and write to them or their parents or their family members or their caregivers. Those are all separate audiences, by the way. You may need to use thus, you might need to use a different voice, a different comprehension level, or even different messaging, depending on the receivers of the information. In other words, caregivers have perhaps far different things on their mind than the patient. A mother has far different things on her mind than what her child is going through than what the child is wondering about the patient so these are the kinds of considerations you need to take into account you know i don't think that enough is said about what is the goal what's your goal what is your goal of the communication what do you want to do what do you want it to achieve is it informational only is it checking a regulatory compliance box um, what we hope is always to provide information. Um, but do you want them to do something? Do you want to spur action? Talk to your doctor, uh, visit our website, uh, seek out something, something whatever. Whatever the, whatever the um, action is you want, don't forget that that might be baked into part of your communication. <clears throat> Mix the media. This is a foundational concept of readability and plain language writing. Mixed media, foundational. Graphics, video, written text, navigable content. What goes out on social media? This is all, these are all different. So you, when you're putting your plan together, choose the communication channels with, that work best for your target audience and tailor the content, format, and language accordingly. And again, I can't access it. I mean, I can't emphasize it enough that if your information is not discoverable and accessible, what's the point? Nobody's seeing it. So make sure that it is discoverable and accessible to your audience. And discoverability and accessibility, especially discoverability, um, has some, a lot to do with if it's published. Uh, and we'll talk about published plain language writing in a moment. Next one. This is, don't need to talk much about here. Here's, I, many people asked for um, links. Here are some, uh, there are many. Uh, one, here's what one thing to know about these Readability and suitability um, assessments. You'll see um, some very common names out there, uh, like methodologies, but they may not be directly accessible unless you go through a paid uh, portal, such as Grammarly or Readable. So these folks like Grammarly and Readable they combine multiple methodologies to come up with a score, uh, like a blended score. It's eight out of 10 readable for this type of, uh, type of audience. So educate yourself more about the links that are out there uh, with the links uh, on how you do assess readability. If you need to 
what are the appropriate readability levels depending on your audience and how you measure that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we uh, talk about SSCPs, um, which has a slightly different uh, type of goal than uh, posting on social media, for example. Uh, and the difference between if you're talking to an HCP or if you're talking to a patient. Uh, so here's some, I, we hope it's helpful. Here's some um, links about readability and suitability. Keep going. So Fact MI, their, uh, their website is down at the bottom right of the slide. Fact MI put together, I, I, I just attended a conference and they spoke at this conference about what they, um, some, some um, research that they did. They did a, a study looking at the differences of preference between healthcare providers and patients and, and caregivers about the format and content of plain language. How do they want to consume their information? And where do they want to access it? And what do they want to, it to look like? And how do they want to interact with it? This is really great, really very enlightening. If you let it sink in, for those of you out there that are in marketing, um, this is, it, I thought this was a really great study. And let's, so let's walk through it because there were some surprises. Preferred technology platforms, uh, HCPs, the fact MI didn't even ask them about their preferred technology platforms, but with patients, because we assumed, I think they assumed it was the internet. Um, patients and caregivers, however, they preferred internet, computer, tablet, smartphone. They were not or less comfortable. They were less comfortable with social media, online chats, podcasts, and virtual assistants. Now, I'm sure if you stratified that by patient and caregiver age, that would certainly be relevant. But in general, that's where they landed. Talk to me via the internet. I can do that. The computer, I can do that. Or on my tablet or smartphone. Um, you start losing me if you go out onto social media. Maybe I'm not on that. Maybe I don't. I'm not on TikTok or Instagram. Um, and then the online chats and podcasts and virtual assistants, it's actually in order. I think the virtual assistant came in last. So how do, you, how do they like to get their information? HCPs, this was very interesting. In fact, MI put a few different types of documents in front of them. The uh, scientific response document uh, as text only. In, uh, in as an infographic only with and without navigation. And the number one came up is that it was a navigable scientific response document. In other words, it was heavy on text, but with links. So then staying on the left side of the chart, their next favorite was an infographic. Again, infographics commonly have links in them. So again, the links made it easy. Video, the, a patient-centered SRD, and then finally slides and other, probably because those are not very searchable. So remember, this is an important point that I wanna to make to everybody. HCP, HCP content, focused content, isn't always because the HCP, its intent, isn't always because the HCP wants to get the cliff notes on the study results. It, it isn't necessarily always about that. Although that's a big part of it. Just give me the highlights. The other thing that's on HCP's mind and why they like plain language um, at a patient level is because they want to go, let, and let's just take a plain language summary that's out there on um, published. And they've got a 20 page article to read and they want to read it because it's very interesting, but please tell me what the cliff notes are. And a published um, plain language summary that often goes with and is uh, an enhanced content of a published article the HCPs like to look at that because then they know what 
to say to their patients. It's not necessarily for their own edification. It's so that they can understand the best way to speak to their, their audience, which is patients. So I thought that that was an interesting finding. It's not just about their own understanding, but give me some hints about how to talk to my patients about this study or about this content. So that's HCPs, but look over at patient and caregivers, their top choices. Is it any surprise that they, the, the, um, I'm a nurse and I already knew when I looked at all the different uh, choices, which the first one would be. They want to talk to somebody. They want to go into their healthcare provider whom they trust, likely, and whom they have a relationship with, likely, but that they can get their questions answered. Um, so 70%. And then text with some graphs and so on, you can see there. So before we leave this, and there's the survey, it's not a bad number in a 527, um, the HCPs and patient caregivers a thousand. So, and there's the split between patients and caregivers. So it was a, it's, you know, that's, I think this is a pretty robust study, but, and I hope the takeaway here and why I included this is, is as you're contemplating what the content is and who your audience is and how you can best communicate with them or whether to write a plain language summary for a published article or not. Uh, take the time to do that. Um, keep these in mind. Uh, I, so we hope that this was useful as you're designing your project planning and your plain writing planning. Uh, next slide. So this is a fun slide. I have to admit I had fun putting it together. And why does it, why is it there? Because it is content, information is everything, everywhere. I would also include everyone all at once. So how do you, it is your your job, you are the you are the deliverers. In most cases, I imagine in this audience today, you are the deliverers of the information. You have all of these requirements from TV to talking to your HCPs, to the caregiver, putting it out on internet, social media, you know, posting plain language summaries on Udemed if you're um, in the medical device world for those SSCPs that you have to put out there. It's everywhere. And how do you, as, a, as teams, what, where do you start? How do you tackle it? How do you make order and sense out of it? And, and maybe if some of you watch this movie, th there are some key themes at the heart of this all. It's like, keep your eye on the most important person. And in this, so the most important person is your audience. So maybe that's the top level message. Keep your eye on the most important person, which at, at that moment when you're developing content is your audience. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about communication and um, plain language summaries. Go on there, Olivia. So types of lay summaries. There are many names for these, by the way, plain language summaries, uh, lay summaries, lay English summaries, it's all the same. So there are regulatory lay summaries. Uh, summaries of clinical study reports for study participants. Focus is a little different there. It's on the description of the trial and endpoint result. That's, that's really what that summary's focus is. And then required for all class three medical devices, certainly including active implantable, is the um, EU guidelines there with regards to good lay summary practices and the writing of SSCPs. So for those of you that are not in the medical device world, that's a uh, summary of safety and clinical performance that's required for certain classes of medical devices. And it must be posted out on a website, which you saw on the previous slide called Udemed. So th that's a different kind of writing than it is uh, when you're writing for social media, for example. And then there's publication associated plain language summary. You can find a lot of information about these last two big bullets. 
plain language summaries, whether they're going to be standalone or they're going to be associated with a publication that's being uh, published at that time. When do you do you do you write a plain language summary that is associated with an article or not? First of all, it's a question. And if you decide that you will, when do you publish it? And how do you publish it? So let's talk a little bit before we go off of this slide about what that means. Plain language summaries for published articles is, is what we're talking about right here. Do you, and the question on the table is, for your team is, do we write a plain language summary for this article that's been accepted for publication or this study results, or do we not? And if we do, when? Uh, at the time of publication or at some point after? Some other, some other key things to know about with regards to these publications is that um, this, I heard this from many, from many sites and from many people. It is not desirable to write a plain language summary and publish it as a supplement uh, to your published article. Supplements are hard to discover and they're difficult to access. They're not as easy for the audience, plain language audience, to find supplements. But the good publishing practices and other key associations do, do um, endorse, enhance what they what is called enhanced content. And that would be a, a plain language summary. It would be an enhanced content of an already published article. And that enhanced content has its own DOI and is accessible through searches. Whereas again, in supplement, if it's buried in a supplement, it's a supplement just says supplement. It doesn't say anything about the, about the interior contents of the supplement. So again, think about discoverability and accessibility for this plain language. The other option, of course, is to make a plain language summary, a short one, um, part of the published article, you know, stacked right there at the top of the article as someone is uh, accessing the article and there's a plain language. That's also good to do as well. But patients may be less um, eager to search for an article and then be disappointed that they can't understand the article and because there's no plain language summary. So I really like the enhanced content route with regards to making it easy, easier and more discoverable. So there is, and that's, again, I just wanted to say then there's another guideline, considered an acceptable secondary publication by ICMJA. So this is, these are things to think about as you're making your project plan and your publications plans. Keep going. Here is some discussion. I, I don't think I will um, linger on this very long, but we thought it might be useful to uh, note, of course, that the there are these lay summary requirements are very different in the EU versus the United States. As in, there are requirements in the EU, and there really aren't in the United States. Is the sort of the short story. Uh, and then some sources at the bottom if you want to find out some more information. Again, we're talking about plain language summaries. So next slide. So let's look at like a project plan. What would that look like if you are going to put together a plain language summary? And, and I know we're all project planners on this call, but let's kind of walk through these steps. First of all, step one, rationale and scope of the plain language summaries. And so we've already talked about this. What is the what is the goal? What do you want it to achieve? Who is your audience? But don't forget the last part of that sentence. What are your measurable metrics for success? Or are you just throwing it out there and seeing what sticks and hope for the best? Or are you going to follow up uh, with tracking to try to determine if that uh, style or writing or format 
reached your audience and then resonated with them. So determine your measurable metrics of success. Determine your target audience. Identify all the dissemination channels. We've already talked about those. So who are your key stakeholders for co-creation of PLS? Let's, let's linger on that a moment. Stakeholders can be internal. Certainly don't forget your internal partners. Uh, then that's the first thing we think of. But who are your ex external to your company? Who are your stakeholders? I would argue that the first is the patient, the audience. So in, identify ways to, in, to involve the, your audience. And I might have mentioned it already, but I'll mention it again. When you are like for the review process of a plain language summary, who reviews it? We've talked about readability and suitability. Sure, we, we, there's tools. Sure, you can run, run your content through a, um, uh, some sort of metric that, that spits out metrics about the readability and suitability. But have you asked your audience? And there's a lot of uh, advocacy right now for including your audience in the review of the content. Um, they are the ones, after all, living with the disease or the whatever the health concern is. What do they think? of your content. So many, many um, companies are beginning to reach out to their own patient advocacy groups, asking them to review this. Do they understand it? Or whatever the content is, do they understand it? Is, it? is it giving them what they need? Back to that first precept, that they understand it the first time and it gives them what they need. So that's what I mean by stakeholders there. Write it, disseminate it, track the dissemination and measure your success. Next slide. Here's an example of a timeline. I'm not I'm probably not gonna walk you through it, but because you all are very familiar with this, but this is an example timeline if you wanted to um, publish a lay summary. So an example of timing differences would be, you know, one company wants to do it one way and another company would want to do it another way. For example, the two choices are the company A wants to have the lay summary available much earlier in the process than um, company B. They've got a much more lengthy timeline. So this was, uh, again, be thinking about your timelines about when you want the lay summary available. Next slide. Here are some objectives. A brief description of the public of the scientific publication that provides the source information and make sure it's understandable to the general public and enables the reader to formulate and ask questions. Hmm. Collaborate with intended you want to collaborate with intended audiences to co-create and review PLS content and readability. We've talked about that a couple of times. You want to improve transparency, accountability, accessibility, discoverably, discoverability, and inclus inclusivity. And add and augment value to a traditional scientific publication by including what is called enhanced content. That should be some of the objectives or the primary objectives of performing a plain language summary and publishing it. Next slide. I won't go over this a lot. It's one suggested template for plain language uh, summary. And so I've provided the headings here. Uh, I, I will let you look at that for a moment, but it's certainly on the slides. Key messages. What did we want to find out? We being the the manufacturer or the company. What did we do? What did we find? What were the limitations of this of this data? And how up to date is it? Like we did this last year or we we did a retrospective study of 20 years. Next slide. Final thoughts. Last slide. Final thoughts on the writing and the summaries. 
educate yourself and congratulations. Thank you for coming today because this is part of, you know, trying to understand this. Um, educate yourself and your team on the principles of plain language writing. But too often, I think people think they know what it is or how hard can it be? And it's as, you know, Willy Wonka there is saying, it is hard and who knew? Identify your resources, fill gaps, engage with your patients, advocacy groups, advocacy groups, caregivers, and of course your cross-functional team partners, plan. And often in many of my other webinars, I always say, do not underestimate the value of time. So I'm gonna say that out loud because time is can either be your friend or your enemy. But I, I change it up a little bit here. Do not underestimate anything. Um, if you're under deadlines, don't, uh, that's a time thing. Don't under, <clears throat> excuse me, don't underestimate your resources to do this for sure. And are, do those resources know what they're doing? Don't underestimate roadblocks and delays. So those are some of my thoughts. Uh, next slide, I think I'm going to start taking questions now. Olivia? Oh, oh one, more, one more thing. Yeah, yeah, Olivia, one more thing. Here's this big uh, slide uh, that has lots and lots of, I'm not going to say anything. I'll let you guys look at it and see if any of this, uh, these um, links are useful. Now I'll hand it over to Olivia. All right, that concludes our presentation today. You will receive these slides in a PDF format later on, so you can take a look at all of these links that Lori has provided for you. We will now turn to our Q&A portion, and Lori, let me know when you can see the first question on your screen. Okay. This question is from Annika, and she's asking, there seem to be two types of plain language summaries required for different types of documents. Is this the case? I, um, I'm not sure uh, about the different types of plain language summaries, types versus intent. So for example, is a plain language summary going to be published or not published? And then where does it go? Uh, who is the audience? Is it a plain language summary that's very high level that might be published just right at the top, very short, at the top of a published article? Or is it a standalone document that would um, be published separately and have its own DOI and be discoverable that way? Another, another part is who are you talking to in the summary? Are you talking to the HCP? It's not intended for uh, even in plain language, you can still talk to the HCP in plain language, but it may be a different level of plain language and the readability and suitability because it is intended for the HCP audience. Is it still plain to them? Sure, but it has a different comprehension level than if it's meant to, if, it, if that's another summary is meant to be um, aimed at the patient. So those could be some of the different types, is it intended for the patient or is it intended for an HCP is two, two primary ways. Think about that table that we went through earlier in the slide, um, HCPs versus patients and caregivers and their preferred methods of receiving information. So I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks, Lori. Here's our Next question from Sunel. At what age range should you gear an SSCP? So Sunel, the, I'm assuming that you're talking about the plain language, the patient section of the SSCP, because clearly the other section of the SSCP is very, not at all intended for a patient. And just for the general audience, uh, the SSCPs, summary of safety and clinical performance required by uh, the EU, they are published and put on a website called Udamed, as where many other documents go. 
and um, they are discoverable that way. And only certain types of medical devices, a class, I should say, of devices require a patient section per, per regulation. So not all SSCPs require a patient section, but the ones that do, then what age range should you gear that patient section to in the SSCP? I think, Sunil, that that uh, speaks directly to the age of the patient that has or interacts with that medical device, uh, first and foremost. Uh, first, first of all, are we talking about a toddler? In which case you would pre, pre reading, you would be talking about to their parents, caregivers. Uh, if you're talking about patients that would typically get a device in later age, let's say a cardiac stent, um, then gear towards that. So I think from a medical device standpoint, but medical device standpoint, the first order of business is who generally gets this medical device? Which, what kind of patients? Who are they? There might also be sensitivities with regards to ethnicity, gender, certainly gender, and, um, and race, for example. All sorts of um, other things to be thinking about besides their age and speak to that audience. So I hope that helped. Okay, thanks, Lori. Here's our next question from Anjali. How do you create content mm -hmm. and target multiple audiences so that you can ensure the content is accurate, but also easy to understand? So Anjali, thank you for this question. And there's a, I think there's quite a bit going on here with this question, which is perhaps uh, manufacturers are trying to figure out how can I, how can we become more efficient is, is what I'm sort of looking at here. It's like, how can we create content efficiently so that it can be deployed with minimal updates to multiple audiences, right? Um, the other part of that is, oh, oh, but by the way, we have to remember our messaging must be accurate and consistent across those platforms and also maintain readability and suitability depending on the platform and depending on the uh, audience. Th there's a lot. I, I would refer us back to the everywhere, everything everywhere all at once slide. And this is exactly what this question is going to. It's like, it's going in all different directions. How do you make sense of it all? Um, make a plan, uh, make a, uh, you know, kind of some sort of like a mind map so you can keep track first and foremost, foremost of the information and the messaging, because that's key. Uh, first, is that you're not saying something different to this person or implying something different to this audience than you, member than you are to maybe the same audience member, but out on social media where your characters are limited and so forth. So make a plan, make a mind, whatever mind map, whatever it is that you do from your team, involve your cross-functional stakeholders so that everybody's working off the same plan. Because you're exactly right. If you lose track of the message and you lose track of what you're saying to who, um, you're, you're gonna run into trouble. Uh, nobody wants that. So great question. All right, moving on to our next question. I'm gonna put two questions up on the screen, Lori, that came in through the chat um, that are pretty similar. The first one is from Marie. How do you approach excited marketing teams from a straight regulatory perspective? And the second one from Diane, how do you coach colleagues on the topic? Marie. Um, I love your question. Excited marketing teams. I'm guessing that you're the regulatory person on the cross-functional team and you get your, your marketing teams might get, you know, out ahead of themselves sometimes. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm just guessing. And um, they want to go and do all these exciting things. 
in all these exciting channels. And isn't that great? And we've got so many great ideas. Now somebody needs to snap their fingers and give me all this content. While you, the regulatory people, and I've, I've worked in, in big medical device companies, regulatory people are kind of the womp womp people. Just a, a darn minute, everybody. Um, we can't run afoul of regulations. So how do you approach them? And then how do you coach them? Which is the second question. How do you coach and come together as a very diverse team cross, of cross-functional stakeholders to come up with the right approach? Mm -hmm. We've already talked about things like making a plan, making a mind map, don't get a, or, you know some sort of map, project map or a project plan. Define your key message points and don't lose sight of them ever of what they are and define what you maybe one way is to define what you can't say in other in other words these are something this is something we cannot say no this is not the because i know that regulatory and i know your risk people are thinking the same thing you're worried about making claims out there that somebody in marketing said this is the best fastest strongest something something and then here comes the regulatory authorities saying, prove it. You're really the best? Uh, says who and says what data? So, so I think getting all in a room together, getting on a Zoom call, I think a room is better. Uh, are we doing that anymore? And defining the boundaries and defining the must-haves and the cannot-haves would be uh, some places to start. And coaching colleagues on the topic, that's a slightly different question in that colleagues who may not be, uh, maybe the colleagues in the sentences are my marketing colleagues, which they may not have a full grasp of the nuances of the device or drug and the traps that we can't say and the, the learnings that we, we got from our clinical trials and other sources of data. So again, getting folks in the same room, and I, I really do sort of like my idea of the what can't we say? We cannot say these things. It's like, we can't cross this line. We can argue about how to say the acceptable messages, but here's things we cannot say. That, those are my those are my two cents on that. Okay, thanks. Here's our next question from Katarzyna. Could you please give us some solutions to common pain points, for example, standardizing key messaging across multiple written deliverables and platforms? Oh, well, I, thank you for the question. I I think we've already sort of talked about that, I hope. Um, is that, but but it gets to the heart of what we've talked about in the probably the last couple or three questions, which is that standardization across multiple deliverables and platforms. So um, I hope that the content that, you know, the questions that we just um, addressed answers this question. And then I, I feel those common pain points uh, is another way of sort of saying what we've just been talking about is, what can and can't we say are, you know, aligning across uh, cross-functional teams with stakeholders that have multiple points of view. All of these are, these are all common pain points. Um, I would say another common pain point that we haven't talked about. I, I know you said, for example, standardizing key messaging, but I would say um, timelines and uh, deciding on what the content is and when, and how much, and to whom, and, um, and, uh, and on what, via what platform, and making that project plan and not, and agreeing to it, and then executing on it so that there isn't somewhere along the line, ooh, ooh, I have another great idea. I want to change everything. Somebody comes up with that. You, you execute, you got to execute through to the end and um, stick to the plan and measure those metrics for success. Next slide. Next question. 
All right, I think we have time for one more. This question is from Vincent. He's asking if you have any recommendations for determining if a document is written to the correct readability level. Well, um, certainly to test it, uh, don't, don't guess would be the first caveat. Second caveat is look around for a, a, a platform, read, readable, Grammarly, slash Kincaid, uh, whatever those, choose, choose something that works for you. Because a lot of those paid content, paid methodology uh, websites, and they're, they're very inexpensive, not like it's gonna cost a lot of money, but they're useful um, because they, they, uh, they do the work for you because they apply multiple um, methodologies to assess readability, suitability, understandability, um, and make suggestions. They often they make suggestions like too many words or move your um, verb closer to your subject. Uh, or visually, they can even make visual um, uh, recommendations, uh, font size recommendations. I I'm not even going to blow your mind with all of the things that um, plain language entails. How big is your font? What font are you using? What color is it? What do your um, what is your amount of white space? How, what is your ratio of white space to content? How is it placed? What are you saying? Are you using bullets? What do they look like? It goes on and on and on. It's it really is mind blowing. So my recommendation is invest in a, a tool that you like and that gives you the information and the feedback that you want and is actionable and you understand for your team so that you can take action on it and fix whatever you need to fix in the content. All right. I think one more. Let's squeeze in one more. One more. Okay. So this last question is from Sri Kant. And Lori, if you could please advise on how to write for patient SSCP. Oh, um, that Sri Kant, I'm probably not gonna do that today. That is a whole webinar. Uh, that's for sure. I think just in general, and, and by the way, it does bring up, I, actually, I do, I, I do have a little announcement. I, I'm not going to get a lot into this question right now, but I want to, you know, let everyone know in the audience that this, this is the first of a three-part series on plain language writing that I'm putting on over the next few weeks. And the other two parts are specifically divided into writing for HCPs and then writing for patients. And in the patient section, I'm gonna talk about writing for, you know, writing specifically for patients. And Srikanth, I think I am going to, because Criterion Edge does many, we've done many, many, many SSCPs numbering in the hundreds at this point. And of course we know that not all SSCPs have patient, require patient content, but many do. And our experience, I can tell you a little bit about our experience before we jump off. Our experience with our clients is that our clients do want to, sometimes do want to see the readability and suitability score. Um, what they do with that afterwards, like do they submit that as part of the regulatory submission of the SSCP? I actually don't know. They will define for us that, you know, we want a score of this. Uh, or they don't, they don't give us any guidance on that, which is all too common. And we use certain tests, certain, certain readability scores, and we aim at that, you know, really that eighth grade level. Um, and I just went to a conference uh, about this. And one of the questions that came up was, um, how do we, how do we know? How do we know who to talk to? Uh, exactly, and, and and I raised my hand because there were a lot of uh, manufacturers and 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 companies in the audience, and I'm you know we're not a we're neither we're a 
focused service provider of writing services. And I raised my hand and I said, as a writer here, we would need that guidance from you. You're, you know your device, drug, audience, patients better than we do. So you tell us who we're talking to. And so I would start there is define that. Who are you talking to for whoever's going to write that patient SSCP and, and make sure that you understand their needs. And everybody, I, I want to thank you all for coming to this. I'd love to see you show up on the other uh, webinars that are coming up in this series. If you'd like, I hope you found it useful. This is a huge topic and it's very, it's, it, there's a lot, it's, it's very confronting. I know that there's, I know that many of your teams are trying to wrap your head around all of this. So we're here to help. If you want to reach out to us or me with um, any kind of follow up questions, and I'll turn it over to Olivia. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Lori. And just as Lori said, if you have more questions on the content we discussed today, or if you would like to learn about our services, you can schedule a free appointment with our specialists. Our contact information is here on the screen consult at criterionedge.com. Thank you everyone for attending and for all your great questions. Have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you next time.